All right, why don't we go ahead and get started. So quick introduction. My name is Mark Lamonica. I'm the product manager for Morningstar Premium and Morningstar.com.au. And today we're going to talk about the transition to retirement. But before we start that, a couple of housekeeping items. So number one, anything you hear today is general advice. I don't know anything about you, so I can't offer personal advice. For our friends over in New Zealand, um, if you want a copy of our FAP, you can go to our website, Morningstar.com.au. And if you would like personal advice, the New, the New Zealand regulatory authorities encourage you to go talk to a financial advisor. All right. And the other thing is I'd love questions. There's a Q&A button on here. Ask any questions you want. There's also a chat function, so you can send them through there. But let's just get into the PowerPoint. All right. So what are we talking about today? We're talking about how to prepare for retirement. And there we go. As a way of a little bit of a disclaimer. What are we going to talk about? We're going to try today to walk through some of the risks that retirees face so that people can get an understanding of what those are. So we're going to talk about some of the rules and why those rules may not apply to everyone. So everyone, well, a lot of people like simple rules, do this, do that. Um, but all of us have unique situations. And that's why all of our retirement plans need to be unique. And we all have to think about how different risks impact us based on our own particular situation. So today we're going to try to understand the risks and the different ways, and there's a lot of different ways that you can mitigate some of those risks that people transitioning to retirement face. And we'll use an example um, as well. And that example obviously is not something that's potentially applicable to, um, to everyone, but hopefully it's an example that allows you to go through some of the different thinking that you need to do once again, based on your own particular situation. So that's the plan for today. Try to understand something, which is very different from knowing a fact. Okay, so what are the traditional approaches to retirement? Well, there's two basic things that, uh, that go into retirement. One, you've probably heard about the 4% rule, and I'll explain both of these. Um, so that's a, uh, that since kind of the mid 90s has been a uh, has been one of these rules that people like to gravitate to, because um, it's much easier, obviously, to follow a rule than understand something. The other thing that we're going to talk about is this so called glide path, which is on the right hand side. And that glide path is um, represents how your asset allocation shifts during retirement. Um, so we'll talk about both of these. But uh, let's start with the 4% rule. Okay, so what do you need to worry about in retirement? What are your big worries? Well, two of the things that you need to decide is you spent your lifetime building up a portfolio. Um, so you've spent a lot of time saving and investing, and now you need to make that transition where instead of you feeding more money into your portfolio, your portfolio is now going to be used to support you. So the most important thing, obviously, is figuring out how much money can come out of your portfolio. And that's why the 4% rule is really important. So the 4% rule, oh dear, I did something. Sorry about that. All right, so the 4% rule is supposed to tell you the safe withdrawal rate that can come out of your portfolio. So how did this come about? There was a financial advisor, and we're gonna talk about some of the risks um, people face in retirement in a second. There's this financial advisor named William Bengen in the US. And these are the questions, of course, that all of his clients were asking him. Now that I'm retired, how much can my portfolio support me each year? How much can I take out without running out of money? So he came up with the 4% rule. Now we'll talk about the risks he was trying to mitigate in a second. But basically what he did is he said, okay, I got to try to figure out two different things. I got to make sure that people don't run out of money before they die. And I need to figure that out in all sorts of different market conditions. So he was doing this in the mid 90s. And he went back and he took stock and bond returns from 1926 to 1992. And what he basically did is he just ran a Monte Carlo simulation, which just means he took all the possible combinations of returns and tested them all out. So the simple way of describing this is, and I'm making up these numbers, let's say in 1926, the stock market went up 10% and the bond market went up 2%. That's one combination of 27, stock market went up 12%, the bond market went up 6%. He would try those different combinations. What would happen if 
1927 returns happened the first year of retirement, and then the other returns happened the last year. And he basically just did this over and over and over again to try to come up with a rate that within any historic market conditions would have meant that retirees would not have run out of money in 30 years. So he's looking at a 30-year time period, and that was supposed to account for the fact that, or was supposed to account for longevity risk, which we'll talk about, basically the fact that you don't want to run out of money before you die, because that's a problem. So he came up with this 4% rule, and the 4% rule has kind of been, it's been controversial since he came up with it. Some people have said it was too conservative. Um, and he answered, of course, it was conservative. I was trying to make sure that even under the worst market conditions, this would still hold up. Some people said it potentially is now too aggressive. And we'll get into some of the reasons why it may not work right now. But let's quickly go to the glide path. So the glide path, very simply, is saying that as you approach retirement, and as you go into retirement, you are going to change your portfolio to make it more conservative from a volatility standpoint. So volatility, of course, is how much the value of your portfolio bounces around. So naturally, as you get closer to retirement, you dial down on the risk assets, which are equities, very simplistically equities, and you dial up the um, defensive assets, which are bonds. So that's basically the idea. There are all sorts of different rules that you take your age and the age is supposed to equate to an allocation. Um, but this has also been kind of upended right now. So these are the traditional approaches. But let's go and we'll talk about why many people say these may not work anymore, or at least work the way they used to. But let's talk about some of the risks that you're facing as a retiree or as you're planning for retirement. So there's two big ones that you face. So number one is sequencing risk. All right, so sequencing risk is a risk that the, as you can read, the order and timing of your investment returns are unfavorable, which means you have less money for retirement. So what this basically means is you do not want to retire in a bear market. Um, and we'll show a slide next that shows this and, uh, and what can happen. But the point is, yeah, you don't want to retire in a bear market. So even if your average returns are the same, if the returns are very negative when you first retire, it increases the chance you can run out of money. Now, it basically means you're going to draw down that portfolio a lot faster. So this is something people face as they go into retirement. Um, and, uh, and so how do you combat sequencing risk? And we'll go back to what we we're talking about before. So one thing you can do is lower the volatility in your portfolio. So what does this mean? That means that classic glide path that we we're talking about. So if you're worried about giant falls in your portfolio value when, uh, when you first retire, you can make it so those are less likely to happen. And the way that you do that, of course, is you invest in more stable assets with lower volatility, like bonds or like cash, for example. Um, so that's a lowering volatility in your portfolio. But there are other ways that you can do this. And we'll get into the specifics around this. Um, that is the traditional way, this glide path. But there are other ways you can do it. If we think about what that actual risk is and what the problem is, the problem isn't that the market is going down. The problem is you are selling securities when the market is low, right? So they're kind of two different things. So the way that people always frame sequencing risk is, yeah, giant falls in portfolio value. Now, that doesn't matter, right? Volatility doesn't actually matter unless you sell. So think about that. If I am a 30-year-old and I have this long time period, people tell me, who cares about volatility? You should invest in a high percentage of equities. Because what you care about if you're investing for retirement is how much money you have at 65, not how much money you have at 45. So you can have the market go up and down as long as it's, you know, over the long term going up, you can have the market going up and down, lots and lots of volatility, it doesn't matter, right? Because what matters is the end point. Now, the same thing is true of a retiree, because you could have a 30 year retirement at 65. But the problem and why sequencing risk damages um, or, or lessens the um, life of your portfolio is because of that volatility when you sell when markets are low. And so that's the problem. And that's how sequencing risk works, that if the market falls 50% and I still need to sell off um, a 
fair amount of my portfolio, not a fair amount, but I just sell off some of my portfolio to take money out of it. I'm selling at very low prices and I can't recover from that because I'm not putting any more money into my portfolio. So one way that you can combat sequencing risk and still have a more aggressive asset allocation in a way, and I'll get to this in a second, is make sure that you don't have to sell when the market has fallen. And that's the bucket approach. And what that basically means is that you are keeping some cash. You are keeping a certain amount of years of living expenses in cash. So that will cover you and give you the opportunity for the market to recover. So we'll get into some specifics around that in a second. The other way, of course, or another way is um, you can just live off of income that's generated out of your portfolio. So this is kind of everyone's dream, right? The dream is that you're able to generate enough passive income from interest payments and from dividend payments that you never have to sell anything. So that every year you are getting those dividend and interest payments and they're actually supporting your lifestyle. So that also protects you from sequencing risk because once again, the market is falling dramatically you're not selling anything. You're just living off the income. Now, a couple of very important parts about this. Number one, income is not guaranteed. So if we look on the fixed interest side of things where you're getting almost nothing now, um, yeah, that contractually, they have to pay you that interest, but not if they go out of business, if it's a corporate bond, or potentially if you invest in Argentinian bonds and the government defaults. Um, and of course, on the dividend, on the equity side, dividends are a choice. So it's a capital allocation decision that companies make. And particularly in times where the market is falling a lot, that could indicate poor economics, uh, poor economic conditions, and companies could cut their dividends. So we all saw this in 2020, right? So even sort of the darling of dividend investors in Australia, the banks temporarily cut their dividends. Um, and a lot of companies cut their dividends. So that's another risk that you have to deal with. But in theory, if that income does not change, if you have sustainable dividends that do not get cut, that can protect you from sequencing risk. And then the last is kind of looking at, and this is more lifestyle, um, it's managing fixed versus variable expenses. Um, so it depends upon the other decisions you make. And a simple one is paying off your mortgage, um, for example. Um, the other decisions that you make around the expense side of things. So obviously, if you're paying off your mortgage, and that allows you, you have a place to live, um, that allows you to cut back a lot on variable spending. If a lot of your spending is, you know, entertainment and travel, um, then potentially that's an opportunity to cut it back. Versus the other side of things, obviously, you could choose to keep a mortgage. So you keep making mortgage payments. And then, of course, you have more money to invest, right? Because you're not paying it off. Um, and that's additional money you can invest. People can obviously go and get loans out of their homes. Um, but something to think about, like what is your expense profile and how do you set up that expense profile? Because on variable spending, um, spending that uh, basically you can survive, you have a house, you have enough to buy food, all the other stuff, if you sort of structure your life in a way that most of your spending is then going to, quote unquote, luxuries, um, things that are not necessities, then of course, that can protect you from sequencing risk because you can just cut back significantly. The market has fallen and wait till the market recovers to actually sell things. All right. So sequencing risk is one. And this is an example um, right here. So just a little chart that looks at investor one and investor two. Um, and you can obviously read this. And this is the case where both investors have the same average return. So they both receive 7% per year, but the difference is when these losses occur. So in one case, the losses occur um, early on. So you're 46, you still have a long way to go for retirement. Other investor also loses 15%, but that happens at 64. So right going into retirement. And they're both drawing down the same amount. And you can see here, there is a significant difference in when your money runs out. So that's kind of the issue with sequencing risk. That's how sequencing risk leads into longevity risk is what we're going to talk about next. So hopefully that example made sense. All right, let's talk about long. Longevity risk. So very simply, it means you run out of money before you die. Um, so obviously, the biggest problem with retirement planning is you don't know when you're going to die. It makes it very, very hard to plan anything when there are no dates attached to it. It's kind of like Australia's approach to COVID, where there's a four-step plan, but there are no dates. Like that's not a plan, and that's the problem with that's the problem with retirement. That if you knew exactly when you were going to die, 
then of course it would be easy to figure out how long you actually have to uh, have your portfolio support you. Okay, so what are some of the different ways we can combat this? We can focus on our withdrawal rate. So let's talk a little bit about that withdrawal rate. Um, the withdrawal rate, of course, is 4% is kind of the rule that has been put out there. But let's talk about why some people are worried about the 4% rule. Um, and, uh, and I guess myself being one of them. Um, but what are some of the concerns with the withdrawal rate? Well, let's go back and look at what happened. As investors, and there's this pretty famous Bill Miller quote. So Bill Miller worked for Leg Mason, um, a big fund manager in, in the US. And he had this quote, and I'm paraphrasing it now, where he talked about, as an investor, all the information you have is in the past, but the only thing that matters is the future, right? So any given day, when any of us wake up as investors, it really doesn't matter what's happened before. I mean, that's great. And that can contribute to, of course, our portfolios and what value they're at. But all that really matters is in the future. Now, the future, of course, is unknowable. And so, of course, Bill Bengen went back and said, okay, the only way I can't predict what's going to happen in the future, I'm going to go back and look at a certain return, a long-term period, right, 1926 to 1992. I'm going to go look at that, and I'm going to assume that the future will approximate the past, um, that you know things are going to be pretty similar. But we got to look at um, what environment he was actually looking at and then look at where we are today. And this is one of the risks that people face as retirees now. So number one, what happened in that 1926 to 1991, 1992 period? Um, if we go back and we look at bonds, so Bill Bengen, and this goes back to asset allocation, he modeled a 60-40 portfolio. So 60-40 portfolio means 60% in equities, 40% in bonds. So we went back and he looked at those historic returns and you know tried every different sequence of those returns. He was calculating that on a 60-40 portfolio. So we'll get back to that in a second. But if we go back and look at that time period, so between 1926, and I did this two nights ago or something like that, I looked at the yield on a 10-year treasury bond. So basically, a US treasury bond, the yield is how much interest you're earning um, on that, um, if you buy it, of course, right then. So I looked at January 1st from 1926 to 1992, and the average yield was over 5%. So now we're at like one and a quarter, one and three quarters percent, um, something like that. So from the fixed interest side of things, we can't expect future returns to approximate, approximate anything that happened in 1926 to 1992, because we're starting too low. So remember, uh, remember, of course, that fixed interest moves inversely to interest rates. So prices move inversely to interest rates. So as interest rates have continued to come down, fixed interest went up, um, prices of bonds went up. But now, of course, we have very low interest rates. So many people, I'm just mathematically thinking, we cannot have huge reductions anymore in interest rates, um, just because there's not really anywhere for them to go. So we're not going to probably get a lot of price lift. We're also, because the yield is so low, we're not going to get a lot of interest payments. So the returns on fixed interest are likely to be very different. So that's one case where the historic period that Bill Bengen looked at is not going to approximate, we don't think, the period going forward. The other thing to look at is equities, of course, the 60% of the portfolio. So in that 60% of the portfolio, did the same thing. I looked back at the um, price to earnings ratio, and there's some things wrong with that, but it's an approximation. The price to earnings ratio every month between 1926 and 1992, and I averaged it out. So basically, if you were looking over that period of time, what was the average that a stock was trading for? Well, the average was 14. So a price to earnings ratio of 14. So then if we go and we look at the period from 1992 to, I looked at the end of 2000, the average was 25. That was the average price to earnings ratio on a monthly basis that the S&P 500 in the US was trading at. And if we look at where we're at now, it's over 38. So let's talk about how this is actually going to inform things. Now, a lot of people sit there and say that the price earnings ratio, the rise of the price earnings ratio is justified by lower interest rates. And maybe that's true. But we're still running into the same problem where do we really think returns are going to be the same when the stock market is trading at 38 times as when it was trading at 14 times? And 
obviously you can come up with your own conclusions on there. But remember, returns have been so strong because the average stock went from 14 times earnings to 38 times earnings. So you've got that huge tailwind of lowering interest rates. And we'll spend another session just talking about interest rates. But this is why a lot of people are sitting there and looking at the environment right now. And they are saying, maybe the 4% rule, maybe the assumptions behind that 4% rule don't actually hold true anymore. Um, so something to, uh, something to think about on that withdrawal rate. So it's something you have to consider on your own personal circumstances. Um, what withdrawal rate do you think is safe? There's obviously no answer to it because um, the future is unknowable. But, uh, but that's one thing to look at. And then, of course, when we get to that asset allocation decision, this next one, don't get too conservative in asset allocation decisions. So why does this protect you? Well, it protects you because if you get really, really conservative, then all of a sudden, the chances of you running out of money because you're going to have lower returns over, let's say, a 30-year retirement period, you're going to have lower returns, which means you can run out of money. So right, sequencing risk is looking at when down markets occur, the sequence of returns. But longevity risk, sequencing risk can contribute to it, but longevity risk also has to do with the average return you get. Even if you retire in a period and the market does not fall as you're retiring, still, if that average return is too low, you're going to run out of money. So key there is not to get too conservative in asset allocation decisions. And many people would argue that this classic 60-40 portfolio that, um, that Bengen was using is like a relic from a you know, long distant past at this point. Um, and, you know, to paraphrase a little like 30s and new 20 saying, a lot of people are now saying an 80-20 portfolio is a new 60-40 portfolio. So 80% allocated to equities, 20% allocated to fixed interest. And maybe this makes sense, right? Because it's kind of a natural reaction that people have to really low expected bond returns and no returns on cash. There's a substitution effect where, okay, I'll move my money into equities. The question is, of course, even if the market does not have a dramatic fall, what do we think future returns are going to be when we're trading at 38 times earnings? Do we think that they're going to be the same? Um, that's, uh, that's the question. But anyway, a lot of uh, one way to combat longevity risk is, yeah, exchange some volatility for higher expected future returns by going into or by maintaining a big allocation of growth assets. The other thing, of course, that you can use to protect longevity risk is annuities. So an annuity, of course, is um, when you are basically purchasing a future cash flow, you're purchasing this future stream of income. Um, so for those that are not familiar with annuities, the very, and I'm making up these numbers, the very simple example is I go to Challenger, for example, a company here in Australia that sells a lot of annuities. I show up and I say, okay, I'll give you $100,000 if you give me $1,000 until I die every year. Um, and obviously that'd probably be way too low. And there's different types of annuities. So there are annuities that are lifetime annuities, there are annuities that are set for certain times, there are variable annuities. Annuities are very complicated, but that is a way to protect from longevity risk because what you're protecting from is it doesn't matter what happens with the market. It doesn't matter how long you live. You have a contract that you will receive that money every year. Now, people don't like annuities. Um, generally, um, because I think there's this big fear, and, and this is true, that if I go buy a lifetime annuity, and then I walk out of the challenger office, and I get hit by a bus, well, I've just given them $100,000 in my example for nothing, because um, they don't have to pay me anything because I got hit by the bus. So I think people don't like that. I think conceptually, people have that problem with annuities, but they do offer you a lot of protection um, from, uh, from longevity risk. So that's another. Uh, so that's another example. All right. So we're going to walk through an example. All right. So this was a picture of me that was taken. I think it was last year. I can't exactly remember. Um, but anyway, that's my mother, who's probably tuned into this thing. And I just want to walk through the approach. So I manage my mother's money for her retirement. I just want to walk through an example, not because you should do what I'm doing for my mother, but just as a way of thinking about how do we use. How do we look at these two risks that we face as we transition into retirement? Um, and what are some different things that you can do? Um, and so we're going to get in in a second into the bucket approach. And I'll explain that more. But what I've done with my mother is I basically set up a modified bucket approach. So my mother's been retired. I don't know how long. I 
obviously I haven't seen her in years since I cannot escape Australia. Not that I want to escape for long, but a trip home to the U.S. would be nice. Um, but anyway, so she's been retired for a while, but we've always maintained five years of cash in her portfolio. Um, and basically the idea behind this, five years of cash means five years of living expenses for her in cash sitting in her portfolio. And the idea behind this was to combat sequencing risk. So instead of having to sell securities every single year, so instead of going in and having to sell off, we use 4%, 4% of her, uh, her portfolio every year, we have enough cash, we can still sell off 4% every year, but there's enough cash sitting in there that would protect from having to sell in a bear market. All right. And the classic example of all this stuff is that if you retired right before the GFC, that is an example where, of course, you would, uh, <laughs> Will, is, Will is making fun of my hair. Um, yes, that's what my hair is going to look like in a couple of days if lockdown doesn't end and they don't open barbershops. But anyway, um, thank you, Will, for that. Uh, yeah, so the idea is you keep five years worth of cash. You take that cash out. You don't have to sell in a bear market. If you're tighter than the GFC, last thing you wanted to do is start selling when the market had fallen 50%. If you were tired right before the dot-com. If you were tired on January 1st, 2000, there was a decade of negative returns um, on U.S. equities. So the idea is that it would protect you from having to sell during that huge dot-com crash and then later on in that decade when the GFC happened. The other thing is looking at her expenses you know, we made the decision to um, basically she moved, so is buying a house outright, but to not have a mortgage on her house. Now, obviously, she was fortunate to be able to do that, but that is um, an opportunity where you can remove a lot of those um, expenses that she could have been that she would have been facing. And the alternative, of course, is you could have taken a mortgage out and invested that money. Um, but the idea was okay. Well. Another way to combat sequencing risk is to make sure that she could live off of, you know, basically a variable um, amount of expenses that, yeah, she could go out to dinner and travel and do stuff like that. But that's something that you could cut back and still be able to live because your house was paid. The other, uh, the other risk, of course, is longevity risk. And so basically what my mother's portfolio looks like is there's a lot of cash um, as I said, but then a lot of the investments are still in equities and they are equities that we put an emphasis on lower volatility. So basically shares that would bounce around less. So what does that mean? Like, how do you do that in practical terms? Well, in practical terms, you can go look at the beta um, of a share, but it's also thinking about the type of companies that you invest in um, and the attributes of those companies. So companies generally that pay higher dividends are less volatile. Um, companies that are in uh, non-cyclical industries are less volatile, right? So if you're in a cyclical industry, your fortunes as a company are going to follow the market cycle. Um, so I think I used the example oil the other day. So a lot of sort of commodities and things like that will follow the business cycle. So when things are going great and they're building a bunch of, well, in this case, buildings in China, then BHP can ship a lot of iron ore to make steel. Good times. Chinese economy goes into a recession, they're not building as much, um, then all of a sudden, yeah, those commodity prices come down. That's an example of a cyclical industry. Non-cyclical industry is that if you're a Colgate Palmolive and you sell toothpaste, and if the economy is bad, people are going to brush their teeth. If the economy is good, they're going to brush your teeth. So that's something where you would potentially have less highs and lows, um, but that means less volatility. So it's deliberately keeping investments in equities, but lowering the volatility of them, and then using that cash to uh, as an offset. So that's, uh, that's just an example I wanted to use. Um, I guess so far it's worked out okay. We will see. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I just wanted to sort of walk through like that is, you know, a situation where it's trying to figure out um, what are the different ways that, uh, that you can combat these two based on personal circumstances and circumstances of my mother. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about the bucket approach. All right, so, and I've used this slide before. I thought it was funny, at least initially. Um, I want to talk about the bucket approach because it is a way um, to combat basically sequencing risk um, and in a way longevity risk as well. And the idea, so in my mom's case, using two different buckets, 
but really sort of the classic bucket approach is three different buckets. All right. So what are these buckets? And I'll talk about sort of how my mom's approach varies and why. So what are these buckets? So there's bucket one, that's the KFC bucket. Um, so back when I wasn't in the office by myself and Shawnee and Will were here, that would be Shawnee's bucket because she loves KFC. Um, so you have this first bucket, that first bucket has one to two years living expenses and cash. Um, so what that's supposed to do is obviously, yeah, protect you um, from kind of immediate falls and things like that. Now, obviously with my mother's approach, we extended that. And we extended that bucket to five years. One, because it was a little safer. And two, because you just weren't gonna get, in my opinion, great returns from fixed income. So then we go into bucket two. So bucket two, is intermediate assets. Um, so think of bonds, maybe some lower volatility, higher dividend playing stocks like hybrids perhaps. Um, and so you've got these sort of intermediate term assets that are hopefully generating some income for you. And then we have bucket three. So I always had the, uh, even though I like whiskey a lot too, I was had bucket two is my bucket because I do like beer and would actually kill for a, you know, actual tap pint right now. Um, but anyway, bucket three, that was Will's bucket because Will likes whiskey. Um, so anyway, bucket three, longer term assets. So equities um, with higher risk. And the idea is that you rebalance, of course. So you have a certain amount that you put into each bucket, you rebalance, and then you keep replenishing that bucket one. Um, so you replenish that by sort of opportunistic sales of, uh, of assets, and then you potentially replenish it with uh with income as well all right so we got through a presentation we seem to have some questions and comments um most of them are making fun of my hair okay if anyone has questions or comments that don't um okay so really good comment from from dennis uh so dennis says of course in australia you can't run out of money because the age pension would kick in um yeah so i mean i guess i guess what i'm talking about here that's that's absolutely right dennis so i guess what i'm talking about here is i am talking about people that do want to hopefully live a lifestyle um or that do want to live a lifestyle that's beyond what the age pension can provide now the age pension obviously introduces all sorts of different um different things with retirement planning in terms of the asset tests that happen and things like that. But yes, it is a safety net. Now think about the age pension, the age pension in a way, um, if you were eligible for it, um, when you retired, it's basically an annuity, right? So that does protect you from longevity risk. Um, so an annuity, basically going back and looking at, you know, a defined benefit pension plan. So basically, you know how much you're going to get every year. This is what people used to get from their jobs and from governments um, to find benefit. And then a lot is shifted to defined contribution where you put money in. So super is an example of that, right? You put in a certain amount every year. You can obviously supplement that um, to a certain degree. But uh, but yeah, you don't know what those outcomes are going to be. You just know how much you can put in. Um, and sort of up to you to obviously, um, it's obviously up to you to create a portfolio that, uh, that can allow you to live. But yeah, no, that's a really good point, Dennis. Um, all right, so the anonymous attendee is asked, is it better to sell and rebuy stocks or ETFs along the way, get and save some income along the way, or just leave it to compound over time? What risk should investors consider with both approaches? Yeah, so I mean, I guess what I talk about, um, and there's, there's a couple of things. So obviously, like, I assume you're not talking about a wash sale um, here, which is basically, um, it's a tax law that prevents you from on the end of June selling something, buying back the same share um, so that you can uh, you can harvest losses on it. But anyway, we're assuming that that's not going to happen. Um, the uh, yeah. So the the original question um, is, yeah, is it uh, is it good to uh, is it OK to sell things off along the way um, and buy things back? The thing that you're doing there is basically market timing. Um, and market timing kind of study after study has shown that it doesn't work. It's a great concept, right? It's a great concept that, okay, when shares are really expensive, I'll sell them off and then there'll be, you know, a crash and then I'll buy them back. Um, and yeah, if you can time it correctly, that's great. I think the problem is in both of those situations, historically, what we've seen is that on the upside, shares have continued to go up um, a lot more than, uh, 
a lot higher and these bull markets have lasted longer than people thought they have. And then of course, the same thing with bear markets. Like when do you buy? People sit there and tell you, oh, you buy the dip. Well, sometimes it keeps dipping, right? So if we look at NASDAQ, it went down close to 80%. There are lots of quote unquote dips along the way after the dot-com bust. Um, so the question is, can you actually do that? And most people can't. Um, so, you know, I think the advice that everyone would give you is worry about time in the market, which means giving yourself time to actually compound. Um, yeah, okay. So Brent is asking a question. So he's saying, Mark, is your mother's cash just cash um, in these times of basically zero interest rates? Um, what about a fixed interest and in income for non-growth assets? Yeah, so Brent, it is cash. Um, so like I'll periodically buy term deposits with it through a brokerage. Um, but yeah, it's basically just cash and she's earning nothing on it. And, you know, I think that, and I think justifiably so there is a lot of, um, people are very negative about cash and they should be right. You know, over time, I know this over time, she's actually losing purchasing power with that money. Um, because inflation of course will exceed what, uh, what's actually happening. Um, in the uh, that what you're actually getting from from cash, I know that. But at the same time, cash does afford you a couple of things. Number one, it does buy you, um, of course, peace of mind and safety, um, which is a good thing. Are you paying for that? Yeah, you are paying for that. But it does buy you that peace of mind. The other thing it buys you, if you are a younger investor um, and are not retired, is that it uh, is that it. Um, allows you to take advantage of opportunities. Um, so cash is a really tricky one. You hear different things from different people, but just remember that cash does have a benefit and those are the benefits basically, right? Just like an emergency fund is really important to have um, and nobody would sit there and recommend that, okay, you should have no cash and invest everything in the market because you get in a car accident, tree falls in your house, whatever, you need some cash. Cash does have benefits. So just remember that there are those benefits, then weigh it against those costs. And those costs are decreasing purchasing power and really low interest rates. Um, all right. So Mark Miller is asking, I'm sorry for using your last name. Mark is asking, what about dividends? Are they in the 4%? They are. So basically the 4%, 4% rule. So I just talk a little bit more about how it actually works. 4% rule is just what you're taking out of your portfolio. That could be income generated from dividends. That could be asset sales. So you're selling off um, shares bonds, whatever, um, is just taking 4% out of your portfolio. Um, now, the way the 4% rule works is that 4% is your first year um, withdrawal. And then every year after that, you can increase that 4% by inflation. So very simply, um, million dollar portfolio, you take out $40,000 the next year. If um, if inflation starts to happen, um, so if you have what, 2% inflation, then that's $40,800 that you're taking out that next year. And it keeps going up by that amount. So that's the 4% rule. Um, but yeah, it includes anything. So whether that, whether the money you're taking out is dividends or whether it's asset sales, that's the 4% rule. Now, if you got in a situation, um, and, and think about this, like if you got in a situation where your portfolio was generating enough money to allow you to just live off the income, then that by itself protects you from that sequencing risk and protects you from longevity risk. Um, so those are the twin risks that the 4% rule was de designed to combat. Um, so yeah, that is a situation where if it works perfectly, remember dividends and income can be cut if it works perfectly, because you're never invading principal, in theory, you never run out of money, right? So like the, uh, the simple, uh, very, very simple example is if you go buy making this, let's say you buy CBA, you put all your money into CBA, let's say CBA is $100 a share, and they pay 4% um, dividend, and that's what you can live off of. Um, so that's great. CBA, the price you go to fifty dollars, you can go to one hundred and fifty dollars. You don't care as long as that dividend is constant, as long as that dividend is hopefully rising by the rate of inflation. That you don't care what your portfolio is worth. You care what your uh, you care what income is being generated for it. So you never invade your principal. You're never selling off shares of CBA. You are just collecting that dividend and living. Um, so uh, so yeah, that's sort of the passive income dream, um, right? So that a lot of us have. Um, 
Yeah. Okay. So good question by the anonymous attendee. Bonds have such a terrible return at the moment. What else would you invest in to ensure less volatility if you're transitioning to retirement? Yeah. This is this is the really really difficult. Um, the really, really difficult situation that everyone's facing right now. And this is what has kind of led to this substitution effect. Basically, the fact that people are sitting there and they're saying, okay, I'm not earning anything from bonds. I'm just investing in stocks. Um, and it's worked out well, right? So if we kind of look at since the GFC, that's worked out very, very well. Is it going to continue to work well? Well, it depends what stock returns are. Um, so how do you lower volatility? Well, you know, it's hard. Um, there are uh, there are certainly um, ways that you can lower volatility, as I said, with my mother's portfolio by going into less volatile stocks. Um, so that's a possibility. You start looking at different stocks. Do you want to be investing in tiny mining, speculative mining companies, or do you want to be investing in a big bank? Um, you know, that's the way you can lower volatility. But just remember that they're shares and they can still fall a lot. Um, so, you know, even if even if you invest in something with a beta of 0.8, um, which basically means that it's going to move each way 20 percent. This is historic. Anything could happen in the future. It traditionally has moved 80 percent of the market. So the market goes up 10 percent. It goes up 8 percent. The market falls 10 percent. It falls 8 percent. So that's a pretty low beta stock at the end of the day. Right. Um, 0.8. But the market goes down 50 percent, which it has in a lot of bear markets you are still losing a bunch of money. It's still going down 40%, right? Even if it sticks to that historic beta. Um, so you're always going to have volatility. Um, so really the only things you can do lowering volatility are cash and fixed interest um, and sort of specifically sort of shorter term fixed interest. Um, and longer term fixed interest is certainly a lot less volatile than stocks. That's really the only thing you can do. So that's why a lot of people are left with these very difficult choices. So what I what I would look at is, yeah, remember the risk. So volatility um, is what all of the investment industry talks about in terms of risk. And they have to talk about that in terms of risk. Because if I'm a fund manager, I don't know anything about you. I don't know why you're investing. I don't know what you're trying to accomplish. Um, so that's why I think about volatility as a risk. Now, as an individual, I can start thinking about my own circumstances. What am I trying to protect against as I go into retirement? I'm trying to protect against my portfolio falling a lot in the first couple of years because that is going to increase the likelihood that I run out of money later in life. So if you think about that problem, then you can get a little more creative with ways of solving it, like this bucket approach, like the fact that you can have a lot of cash. Um, so hopefully that... Uh, Helps. Um, okay, so an anonymous attendee in a bit of a in a bit of a political statement says can't count on the age pension in Australia anymore. Morrison has labeled it welfare and is looking to get rid of it. Um, so, um, does it have to be considered high risk? Uh, high risk now? Well, yeah, I obviously can't. I can't answer that question. Of course, with the age pension or any sort of government program, um, just like we saw with franking credits, right in the last election. This is not some like constitutionally protected privilege. It is a law, and the government can change laws, and the government can certainly get rid of age pension. Um, so it's really up to you um, and sort of the way that you read, um, I guess, the political tea leaves and, uh, and just the likelihood that any government, no matter which party, would get rid of the age pension. You do need to take that into account, right? And we, yeah, it's just something that uh, it's just something that you need to worry about. Um, Okay, yeah. So John is uh, so John's asking, do you have any comments on the yield offered on annuities in a low interest rate environment? Okay, so the problem with annuities um, is that basically, if you are an insurance company, you're an annuity company that's writing these annuities. It's a pretty simple thing, all right. So you sit there, you have a bunch of actuaries. The actuaries, of course, modeling um, modeling basically when, on average, people are going to die. Um, based on when they hit different milestones. And you're just simply saying there, okay, if I go out and write a bunch of annuities to people, I know that the average person is going to die at 77. Um, so I can figure out how do I price that annuity so that I can earn investment returns. And that's what they're doing. They're taking your money and they're investing it. And they're trying to earn a return that's higher than what they have to pay out. And the reason they want a big pool of people is so they can just... Um, basically uh, spread that risk that somebody lives a really long time over a giant pool of people. Um, so that's what they're trying to do. 
And the problem is, of course, they have to look at the investment environment and they have to make an assumption on the returns they can earn. And that is going to go into the price of the annuities. And a lot of that, of course, can be fixed interest. So if we have really low interest rates, they're going to worry about that. So basically what it means is the time where you would really want an annuity in a really low interest rate environment, you're not going to get as much. Um, so basically with that $100,000 you put in, you're not going to get as much. So that's the concern. That's sort of the problem with annuities, but you do get peace of mind from them. Um, and so when I use that example of an actuary sitting there and trying to figure out in a giant population pool, when's the average person going to die? That matters to an insurance company. The problem with you, right, is from a longevity risk standpoint, you have no idea when you're going to die. So the average might be 77, but the average doesn't do you a lot of good if you live to 105 because um, you have to have your money last that long. Um, so, yeah, that's the struggle you run into. And everyone always thinks about that. What if I get hit by a bus walking out of the annuity office? Everyone thinks about that risk that I've like given all this money to this company. Um, it's also important to think of that on our list. What if you don't get hit by a bus or don't ever get hit by anything and all of a sudden you live to 105? Um, so, yeah, that uh, it's a really good comment, John. Um, but yeah, it's the problem with annuities. And that's why, and I don't know offhand, I can't say offhand what annuities are actually priced at right now, but I know given the market environment, it's probably not great. When I say priced at, that means when you go in there and you say, I'm going to give you $100,000, it's how much they tell you you'll get back. So they can sit there and tell you, okay, you'll get $10,000 a year or you'll get $1,000 a year. Um, and based on market environments, that's going to be different. So the pricing of annuities will be different. Um, okay, so good question from Lisa. So Lisa, of course, um, has alpacas, and we did hear the very sad news about Molly, um, which was Lisa's dog who passed away recently, which was sad, but Lisa sent a lot of pictures, and Molly looked like a beautiful dog. Um, so she says sometimes a compulsory buyback occurs. How do we best apply the bucket approach to the proceeds if we are in retirement? Okay, yeah, so all the time, of course, you are running situations where, hey, a company that you don't want to sell gets acquired. Um, anything could happen that actually returns cash to you that you may not expect, may not be necessarily happy with. Um, so it's nice, obviously, if somebody goes in and acquires a company you own, but not so nice if you really like it and you don't want to pay taxes on it, um, et cetera. So yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think if there is some sort of compulsory um, buyback or acquisition or anything like that, what you can do is just sit there and think about the proceeds. If you do have this bucket approach and you are refreshing um, refreshing a cash bucket, so that's something I didn't talk about with my mother, that bucket gets refreshed, that cash bucket. So it always stays at five years. So beginning of every year, take the money out that my mother's going to spend in the next year. We send it into just her transaction account. Um, but that bucket needs to be refilled over that year to keep up to the um, keep up with that uh, that five years. So that can mean income that's earned off the portfolio. And it can mean selling things. So in this case, it would be something that was sort of a forced sale on you. But you can just incorporate that into what else you whatever else you're doing with uh, with the bucket approach. Um, all right, so let's see. Oh, we're getting lots of questions, which is good. Um, so I see Phil is asking, the 4% rule runs counter to the requirements to withdraw a defined percentage from super each year, which increases with age and starts above this rate. Okay, yeah, so this is a good question that we always get. Um, so let's talk a little bit about super. So 4% rule would have, of course, invested, uh, was invented um, not thinking about um, structure of account and particular rules around account. So of course, with super, you are required to take out more than 4% once you hit a certain age. And the government obviously is trying to get you to run down that uh, your super balance because they don't want super to be used as just a sort of tax-free tool to pass money to your heirs um, and have people build up these giant accounts. So that's a concern um, that the government has. Just because they force you to take money out of super doesn't mean that you have to spend it. Um, so if the government tells you to take 8% out of super, you can just put it in a different account that's outside of super. Um, obviously, you don't get those tax benefits, but at the same time, you could hold that cash outside of super um, if you wanted a cash component. Um, so you know the smart thing to do is obviously think about the tax consequences of holding different asset types in different accounts. Um, so, you know, Cash is a great thing to hold 
outside of accounts that have any sort of tax advantage because you're not earning a lot of return. You don't want to hold cash in an account where you are getting protected from capital gains tax and things you have to deal with. You'd rather hold it outside. So think about sort of placement of assets as well. But yeah, just because the government tells you to take a certain amount out doesn't mean you have to spend it. Um, okay, well, this is good. So John is saying that he's retired and he's living proof that your strategy works. He manages a self-managed super fund with about 60% dividend equities, 40% in cash and personal portfolio, about 10% of his SMSF with about 60% dividend equities and 10% in cash. Um, and he says he doubled down on the basic strategy and this works for me. Yeah. So I think, I think it's really good. Like I really like hearing examples of different approaches that people take. Um, and what we're trying to do today is sit there and say, okay, what are these actual risks that you're facing? And there's lots of different ways to combat them. Um, so thinking about those risks rather than this idea of just a rule and you just follow this random rule because somebody told you it works. Now, I get that a lot of people want to do that, but you know what we're trying to do here is foster an understanding. Um, okay, Neil's asking, is a beta of one um, the divider between a low volatility and one with high volatility? Yeah, so a beta of one. So remember, now beta is a historic measure. So what beta does is it goes back in time and it looks at market returns versus that individual security return. And it can be rolled up to portfolios, right? You can see the beta of an ETF or a fund um, or calculate the beta of your portfolio. It's like a weighted average of the beta of each thing that you will own in your portfolio. So basically they go back and they look historically and they see as the market moved, how did this stock move? So a beta of one means that the stock moved perfectly with the market. The market went up 10%. The stock went up 10%. The market went down 10%. The stock went down 10%. So anything higher than one is something that we would consider more volatile than the market. So that means that the market goes up 10%, the stock's going to go up if it's 1.2. So then the stock's going to go up 12%. Same thing when it goes down. So when you're in these very highly volatile stocks, it means, hey, the good times are going to be really good. Bad times not going to be great. But remember now, beta, you need to look at it over a portfolio. Like you can look at it on a single stock, but remember a company specific issue could throw off um, what you expect to happen, right? So if you, uh, if you were owning Virgin stock at the beginning of 2020, you can sit there and say, okay, well, I know the beta of my Virgin stock. Well, they went bankrupt. Right. So very, and that's an extreme example, but if there is a giant company specific problem, the stock could fall a lot, even if the market was going up. Um, so that's sort of where beta doesn't work. But if you look at it over a large portfolio, then that is hopefully going to approximate what's going to happen in the future. But that's, uh, that's beta. Um, all right. Let's see. Um, so we've got a question. Um, Okay, so Eric's asking, can one apply a beta filter to stocks using Morningstar analysis? Um, so beta is not something we have on our screener, but maybe it's a good thing to put on. Um, you know, I think uh, I think that if you were looking at, so beta is obviously looking historically at data. What our analysts do, um, they look towards the future. They rate everything, everything within their coverage universe with an uncertainty rating, um, which can be in a way an approximation of um, volatility and cash flows that the company earns in the future. Um, so you can think about that potentially in a volatility standpoint. So once again, when we're using those examples before, the Colgate Palmolive example, that I don't know what the uncertainty rating is off the top of my head on Colgate, but I bet you it's pretty low um, because those are more predictable cash flows. So when our analysts are modeling out the future of the company, of the company's earnings and cash flow, they can predict better what toothpaste sales are going to be. Because you know, I'll tell you this much, like next year, toothpaste sales are not going to be down 50%. Um, right, like we know that Colgate can go up and down, and there can be minor adjustments of demand and market share with their competitors and all this other stuff. But there's not going to be some huge fall off the cliff. Whereas, if you are a very speculative miner who's got a little patch of dirt out in WA that you think maybe there's something in there and you're trying to dig it up before you run out of money, 
those cash flows could be very, very speculative. So that would be very high uncertainty. And chances are that would also reflect in volatility. Um, uh, yeah, okay. So we've got a question from Carolyn saying some superannuation companies have developed with government um, incentives, new products called lifetime pensions like Q Super. What is your opinion of these products? Um, they are not annuities. Um, so I don't know the... Uh, I don't know exactly all the details around the Q Super one. Um, let me, if you send me an, air, an email, an airline ticket, yeah, send me an airline ticket and get me out of Sydney. Um, but uh, yeah, if you send me an email, let me look at the Q Super and some of these products. Um, but yeah, they probably have annuity like um, annuity like uh, components to them. So basically, you know, what's happened if we look at sort of the shift around the world? Um, what's happened is when we move from this defined benefit. Um, pension program to a defined contribution plan, you're putting more of the risk on individuals. And as kind of the first generations where the majority of their savings went into something like super, start to retire, they're confronted with this huge challenge of, okay, how do I convert my portfolio into my everyday living expenses? And so, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of incentives and a lot of people are looking at these problems of, okay, how can we help people do that? Because it's not easy. Um, it is, uh, it is different. Um, okay. Um, so John's asking what determines which shares you sell off each year. Can't really, um, see the portfolio and equal components. Is it yield driven growth driven? Okay. Yeah. So obviously you are making decisions on what to, what to sell off. Um, so there's all sorts of different considerations that, uh, that go into that. Um, and obviously it depends on what your portfolio is. Um, so, you know, there are people certainly that are trying to maintain a certain asset allocation. Um, so if we take a very high level one, if we've got stocks and bonds, um, okay, well, then all of a sudden you're going to start to sell off. If you're 80, 20 portfolio, you want to sell off 80% of the money you're taking out from stocks, 20% from bonds. So you can maintain that asset allocation. You could do it if the asset allocation adjusted. So let's say stocks did really well, well, and they're now 90% of your portfolio. So, okay, you're going to sell stocks to get that back into your asset allocation lineup. And people could have more nuanced asset allocation as well, um, right? If you're looking at international shares and infrastructure and um, real estate, like, you know, you can, you can have whatever asset allocation, however detailed you want. Um, so some people try to use that to manage rather than just simply rebalancing. They can use those withdrawals to manage um, their asset allocation. The other thing is depending upon the account that it's in, tax can play a big role. Um, so are there opportunities to sell shares where you can get capital losses that can, um, that can reduce your taxes? So that's something that people look at. Um, and then of course, you know, I think one way is, and once again, this is, uh, let's see if this works, it takes some nuance. You can look at valuation levels of different assets. Um, so sit, let me sit there and say you own two different stocks. One's gone up a lot. It's really expensive. Um, perhaps that's the one you want to trim that position a little bit on. Um, but yeah, there's no there's no kind of set rule, but that is obviously a challenge. Um, all right, so we've got a or we've got a comment from Miriam saying, in response to timing market versus time in market. Um, I've done buy and hold on managed funds, reinvested dividends, and made little in the way of capital gains long term, except for forced capital gains every year when the fund distributes. So I'm not convinced by the buy and hold. It seems. Uh, main benefit is is for savings. Okay, yeah, I mean it depends obviously what what you're invested in. Um, you know what I will say is one of the downsides of investing in funds and ETFs, and we just saw this actually, um, which I'll get into in a second, is that you do have these forced capital gains um, events. So capital gains from the funds and ETFs, you may think it's a dividend, but it's not just income. They're also capital gains that they are distributing to you in the form of a distribution. Now, distribution can be part income, part capital gains. We've just seen this happen a lot. Um, so BlackRock um, in particular, I think we're going to put an article out about this in the next couple of days, BlackRock forcibly converted everybody in their international ETF into an ESG ETF. Um, didn't really tell anyone, didn't give anyone a choice. They just forced them into this new index. And what that involved is the selling off of a bunch of assets. So a bunch of stocks that did not fit their ESG criteria. And everyone just got this huge distribution. Um, so the distribution is like five times bigger than any other distribution they've ever had. And what that's going to be is a lot of that's going to be capital gains. 
So that is one of the problems of funds and ETFs. And you do get these capital gain events um, that are beyond your control. Um, so I'm surprised more people aren't angry at the BlackRock thing. But, uh, but yeah, anyway. Um, all right. There's a lot more questions that unfortunately we ran out of time. Um, but if anybody, if anybody has questions that they would like me to answer after this, please send them along. Um, so you can just send them into my email address. So it's mark.lamonica1 at morningstar.com. Um, it's the email address that's on this invite. So thank you guys for joining. This went, from my perspective, better than the one last Thursday, which is, uh, which is good. But, uh, but yeah, thank you guys for joining. I'll be back on Tuesday for some other topic. Um, hope everyone has a good weekend. Any advice in this video is general advice or regulated financial advice under New Zealand law prepared by Morningstar Australasia Proprietary Limited and or Morningstar Research Limited without reference to your financial objectives, situation or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest. To obtain advice for your own situation, contact a financial advisor.